All right. Um, good evening. How, how is everybody doing? Good? All right. Um, what, what I'm going to do uh, is to talk a little bit about uh, my emergence as a writer, how I really came to be a writer, and some of the things that led to it, and then talk about this new book. Um, so I'm going to take you back uh, to Sierra Leone, um, my country, which is in West Africa, way before the war. Um, when I was a, a little boy, um, uh, these were things that uh, prepared me for writing, but at the time I didn't really know. Um, my father, when I was about six, seven years old, my father played a game with me. Uh, and what he would do every evening when he returned from work and we were about to go to the town square where there was always something going on, whether it was a, a storytelling, a, a music or something going on there, he would lower himself and I would sit on his shoulders and he would, we would walk around. And the game was that he pretended to be a blind man. Um, and I was his guide. Uh, he had never seen anything, so I would have to describe to him everything that we were experiencing at, the mo at that time. So he would stand up and I would say to him, well, let's go, uh, move forward. And he would say, well, I don't know what forward is. Can you tell me? And I would say, well, you know, forward, you just start to, <laughs> and he would say, no, I don't know what it is. So I would think about it in my, in my little head and I would say, you know, well, if you want to move your foot, which, what is the most natural direction that your foot will go? And then he would move one of his foot. And then I would say, okay, then move the other one and, and keep repeating that pattern and then we will walk. And he would walk towards the wall and I would say, oh, you're yeah, walking into a wall. And he would say, well, you know, well, what is a wall? And again, I would describe to him, sometimes you even deliberately walk into a fire, you know, and I would say, you know, you're going to, uh, you know, hurt both of us. And he would say, well, what is fire? So, you know, everybody knows fire. And I would describe to him what it is. So these were some of the early uh, stages that I really began to learn how to bring somebody else into my own experience, into what I'm seeing, what I'm experiencing, so that they can uh, intimately be a part of it. In addition to this, Another thing that was part of my life was the oral tradition storytelling that I witnessed every evening. My grandmother was one of the people who told the stories and the other elders in my community. I grew up in a small village in Sierra Leone where everybody who was older than you uh, was responsible for you so they can feed you, take care of you, but they could also beat you up if you did something wrong. And you, wouldn't, uh, you would beg them not to tell your parents because you receive a second set of uh, beatings. So, and I very troublesome. I always didn't, didn't like this particular side. But it had its benefits. So I grew up with this oral tradition where every evening we'll be told stories. And for us, the belief was that, and which is very true, that stories are medicine. That when you're young, they are put inside you. Uh, they're, they're fed to you so that it will strengthen you and prepare you to face what life would throw at you later on. Sometimes when I was a boy, stories were told that didn't necessarily make any sense to us, and we would, we would look at each other and say, why are they telling us this story? Uh, one of those stories, actually, I, I tell at the end of uh, my memoir, uh, which is a story about a hunter who goes into the bush uh, to hunt an animal, and uh, he saw um, uh, a monkey, and he lifted his weapon to shoot the monkey, and the monkey said, you know, hold on a second. If you shoot me, your mother will die, and if you don't, your father will die. Uh, when I was a boy, this was told in front of your parents, and I always said I wanted to go to the bathroom because I didn't want to answer the question uh, in front of any of my parents. Uh, but what really, uh, I always ask my grandmother, why are you telling us this story? Uh, what is the meaning? And she would say to me, you would know later on. Uh, some of these stories will mean something to you. And it took me till the end of the world to understand what that story was, which was really uh, the consequences that come about when we engage in violence. Once you lift that weapon, you lift a blow. Once you say something that's going to wound somebody's spirit, there's a consequence, and often uh, they are not ones that, uh, that are easy at all. So uh, this was pretty much my life, and people were very good at telling stories. And with the thing with the oral tradition is that when you're telling a story to somebody orally, you have to tap into their imagination, capture it, and bring it to the landscape of the story so that they can see, smell, hear, feel, and be part of that experience. People were so good that sometimes when the stories were done, if it was particularly a scary story, you wouldn't want to leave the, the fire area. You wouldn't want to look left or right. You're so scared. So also one of the things that oral tradition does is that it commands deep listening. Uh, also when I was a boy, my grandmother would tell me that, you know, in order for you to learn how to speak, you have to first learn how to listen deeply. Because it is only by doing so that you would know 
what to say. So when you open your mouth, everything that comes out of it, it's thought about and it's something that's meaningful. So as a boy, of course, I was curious and, and very inquisitive. I always raised my hand and he'd be like, no, put your hand down. And so you, I learned that. So when I write, I bring all of these things that were part of my upbringing. And lastly, another part of this upbringing was the fact that as a boy, I went to school and I became one of the literate people in my community. Um, Sierra Leone is a former British colony, so the, uh, the English is our official language, even though we have various other languages in the country. Uh, so when you go to school, you learn the former British English. And so as a boy, I, I learned Shakespeare and all of these things. Uh, sometimes I didn't really know what the text meant, but I knew how to say certain things. Friends, Roman countrymen, lend me your ears, come to bury Caesar and whatnot. Um, so because I became one of the literate boys, I would write letters for people in my community. And through this, I began to learn how to translate uh, emotions, how to translate from our languages into English, and, and really work at that a little bit. And because of the way our language is, sometimes people will go on for, for, for a lot, uh, length of time trying to just say one thing. And I also learned at a very early age that sometimes you've got to get to the point. Even when you're writing, you don't have to be flowery too much. Uh, on one occasion, um, uh, a woman had come to me to write a letter, and many people did, and they would give me money and sometimes food, though I, I suspected that these uh, things that they gave me were not necessarily for my services, because I would do it for them anyway. It was a requirement. It was more for me to keep their secrets, because many secrets were told to me, because I had to write and, and read letters for people. And the more secret I knew of somebody, the more so they gave me something. It was, it was very interesting for me as a kid to observe that. Uh, and so on one occasion, a woman had come to me and wanted to write a letter to her uh, son who was living in the capital city. She really missed him a lot, and she wanted him to come, to return home. And she started by saying, I want you to tell my, my, my son, the one that I was pregnant with for nine months, and I went through this difficulty, she named all the difficulties uh, during the pregnancy, the one that I was in labor with for X number of hours, the one when he was born, I couldn't sleep for many, many months, he was crying all over the place, and the one when he could walk, at some point he shot in his pants and I had to take him to the river to wash him. And it was such a, you know, so she listed every single thing. And I'm thinking to myself, first of all, this fellow doesn't want to receive a letter that had all these things in it. Uh, and secondly, all of these things would take a lot of time to write. So I went straight to the point and said, you must come home now. Your mother really misses you. You know, so at a very young age, I learned that at some point you have to, to get to <laughs> what you want to say. Um, so these were really, uh, you know, in, in retrospect, thinking about them now were my early preparation for becoming a writer, which I didn't know. When I went to school uh, in Sierra Leone at the time, everybody wanted to be an economist, uh, a lawyer, uh, an engineer, uh, and all of these sort of um, uh, career choices that are wonderful ones. But if I had expressed that I wanted to be a writer, they would have said, okay, you are not serious. We're going to remove you from school and send one of your, your siblings to school. Uh, so these were the early days of my life when things were very peaceful and, and beautiful in my country, and the simplicity was, was very amazing. I didn't have electricity or tap water, but, you know, and my school didn't have the resources, but yet we learned. Um, of course, this life was interrupted by the civil war that started in my country in the early 90s. And as a boy, I began to lose everything that I knew, uh, and even my community began to change. Uh, once as a boy... If you walk down into the next village, people will feed you, take care of you. But when the war started, the very idea of being a child, being innocent, became a threat to everybody. If you can imagine, when you came through a town, as I did with a group of other young uh, children, the adults would run away from us because they only expected violence from children because they have survived instances where children were being forced to inflict violence on their own communities. So my landscape changed uh, significantly. Uh, before I walk on the path to the next village with nothing, now when I walk on those same paths, there were bodies littered everywhere. Uh, there were bodies floating on the water that we used to go and swim it, and it was filled with blood. So everything changed. Even nature itself changed. The birds were no longer singing. All you could hear were gunshots and things like that. Uh, I was running from that war, and my two brothers, I was the second born in a family of three, were killed, um, including my parents, mother and father, and I survived by pure luck. Uh, came out of that and eventually went to a, a military base along with other uh, young people to look for safety. And this is where we were recruited, dragged into the war to fight uh, with no choice. And that became my life for nearly three years. And I was in that war 
uh, I changed from the kid who loved Shakespeare, who was into American hip hop music and all of these things, uh, to now just a soldier, uh, doing things that I never would have thought I was capable of. To become part of this new family required violence, and violence was the way through you showed that loyalty. Anyway, some of you have read the story that I wrote, the memoir. I was in that war and I was luckily removed by uh, UNICEF, uh, who had gone into the country uh, to try and remove young people from the different fighting groups that were uh, in the country at the time. And I went through rehabilitation and all of it, and eventually ended up coming to the United States, being adopted into a family uh, to live here. It was really through that journey that perhaps the idea of writing about what had happened in my country began to hit me because of some of the things that I encountered. In particular, when I arrived in the United States and my mother started taking me around to go to school. Um, when I arrived, I had nothing. I only had my passport. A passport is a luxury item. In most countries, even though it's a right, you don't have access to it, but I was lucky enough to have one because of the United Nations. Um, and so when I arrived in New York, my mother started taking me around to various schools to get into them. Uh, I didn't have a report card, uh, so most people would not accept me into their schools. They would say, well, do you have a report card? I would say, no. And they would say that, well, a lot of people have report cards. And I always respond to them, I know many people who don't have report cards. Uh, and I and began to think, people do not understand what war is. It's not as if when they're gunning people down and you're running for your life, you're thinking to yourself, you know I must take my report card and, and keep it in my pocket so I can give it to some uh, school administrator somewhere when I arrive. You're not even thinking that you're going to survive to see the next day or the next minute. So all you're doing is run for your life, and if you're lucky, you only come out with your life. So I began to think about it. So the first essay I wrote in the United States was why I didn't have a report card. It was the title of the essay, as simple as that. And I explained some of it, and this actually got me a scholarship. And so for me, writing from that day on, writing became a way to write about things that I had lived my life before people met me that I no longer had any physical proof of. So I used words to recreate those images, uh, to bring back to life uh, what my life had been, the good and the bad as well. And so even during the last year of high school, uh, everybody brought a baby picture for the yearbook. I couldn't provide one because I was the only person who didn't have one. So simple paraphernalia that you may take for granted, uh, I didn't have at all. So I had to write a little poem in the place where my uh, picture could go. Most of my friends who did not know uh, about my background at the time, their only conclusion was that, yeah, you must have been a really ugly baby. That's why you don't want to bring the picture. And I found it very funny, and I laughed at it. Anyway, when I went to university, uh, my country, I went to Oberlin College for my undergraduate in Ohio. Uh, around that time, my country, Sierra Leone, began to appear in the news very strongly, um, even when I was in high school. And the way people began to speak about my country was without the necessary human context. Uh, they were talking about it in a very sensationalized way that the media was presenting it. It was Sierra Leone equals civil war amputation madness. Uh, nobody was talking about the Sierra Leone before the war, during the war, and after the war. It was just during the war to the point that it began to sound that we just woke up one morning and decided, you know, we should really go to war and, and shoot each other. It began to sound like that. So I was very upset and frustrated. So my writing became a way to prepare myself to, when I had the opportunity to be on a panel or anything, to succinctly and intelligently be able to talk about what had happened in my country. In addition to that, uh, people were speaking about former child soldiers, somebody like me who had come from that experience. They used to call us the lost generation which meant that they believed that because we had come out of this war, uh, we would no longer be able to recover. We are a time bomb waiting to explode. We are only capable of violence and nothing more. And here I was, living in the United States, walking past those same people, making those uh, sort of uh, uh, points. In their widest imagination, they would not know if I didn't tell them that I'd had such an experience. So for me, writing became not only to show people what war is to a child, but also the strength of the human spirit and children the resilience of a young person to recover from it if given the right care and opportunities uh, to do so. And so I, I, that's why I started writing. And eventually that became a book uh, that then was published. I never went after publication, really. Uh, by a series of, I guess, accidents that were meant to happen, I should say, uh, I was able to publish this first book. When this book came out a long way gone, I began to realize what it is that I had done in the sense that I became this person that everybody would put a human face to the experience now. And some people did not like the fact that I was in that position. So 
whenever I went on interviews, I felt that they were asking me questions to test whether I had fully recovered or whether I would lose it. So they would deliberately ask questions to upset me. It was very funny, to me at least, because I could see it coming uh, from uh, several miles ahead. Because one of the things that you learn from being a soldier, whether you're a child or anything, is to anticipate things. So I, I knew how to anticipate, and I could read people from, from afar. And kind of, you know, so I used some of these things that may have been negative the way I learned them uh, for my own, that had strengthened me one way or the other. Uh, so I responded to people in certain ways. Uh, for example, the first uh, television show that I ever did when my book came out, it was the first time I was on television, was on CNN. And the woman who was doing the interview uh, asked me uh, how many people I had killed during the war. And my response was, this is... Uh, uh, this is uh, not why I wrote the book. It's not about bravado and counting. And secondly, you've been watching too many Hollywood films, thinking that people are going around and counting during war or, or, or have the luxury to even do that. So I said, honestly, I don't know because, you know, I don't know. There are sometimes I didn't even see where my bullets were going. And so the next time I was introduced on another show, I was introduced as Ishmael Bear, the former child soldier, who said he killed too many people to remember. This is how I was introduced, right? So immediately I began to realize that I had to be very careful in the way I presented myself, particularly to the media, because they would take my words and make it into something else. And I didn't want that message because I didn't write the book to sensationalize violence. Rather, I wanted people to learn about violence, to know how to avoid it, to know the impact that it has on any human being, you know? So I began to see how I can, so whenever I was faced with the media, whenever they asked me questions, I just said what I wanted to say. So when they edited, they were left with something that actually made sense, man. That thing they could, you know, take out of context. So I learned a lot of things on the go. But anyway, during that travel uh, for that book, it's when I began to realize that I needed to write another book, which is not necessarily a memoir, but a fictional thing, which is that I went back to my own country, Sierra Leone, frequently and observed uh, the recovery of my country, returning back into what it had been. Uh, so the writing of Radiance of Tomorrow, this novel, came out of that. Uh, why do people go back after war? And when they return, is it possible that they could go back to the way their lives had been? If not, what kind of life do they prescribe for themselves? And what does that say about who they are? How can they move towards the future when the past is pulling at them? How do they preserve what means the most to them, the tradition, in this uncertain time of their lives? So when this narrative opens in, in a town, in an area called Imperi, you see a lot of people returning it starts with the older people walking on the path, going back to the village. Then you have various people who come from different parts of the war, some who have been victims, some who have been perpetrators, and some who were amputated, uh, and their children as well. You have a young woman returning who had been pregnant during the war and has to raise that child. And the people who caused this suffering to them are also returning home. I also ask the question, why do people return home? What kind of nostalgia that brings them back home? And what stories have they told their children who do not necessarily ex uh, did not uh, experience the war, were born towards the end of the war, and when they return, they have another expectation of this land. So when they all come together, how do they learn to live together? For example, before the war, when you encountered a young man on a path, you did not hesitate or flinched or anything like that. As the young man was carrying a machete. You just assumed that that young man was going to the farm uh, to harvest a crop or to brush the farm. Now, after the war, there was another connotation, another meaning added to that image. So when you saw a boy, a young man with a machete, you hesitated, you flinched when you encountered them on the path. How do you learn not to do that? Bef during the war, uh, when these four by four vehicles would come past the village, soldiers would come up and, and, and do harm to the people. So after the war, when women were coming from the river fetching water and they heard SUVs and things that are coming, they would run. How did they learn not to do that again, to trust? in the very place itself again. So I, just, I talk about all of these things. How do you raise a family? How do you start schools again? So this narrative really looks at this community trying to build itself and what happens and how they fight to do that and other newer challenges that they begin to face in their lives. Uh, because my observation also came out of this was that uh, the media and uh, even the international organizations are interested in countries when there's bloodshed, when things are happening there that have shocked humanity. For example, in Syria, everybody talks about Syria. As soon as that ends, it ceases, every attention shifts to the next equally violent situation. And nobody pays attention, how do people begin to live there again? So my, really, I wanted to talk about how that works. 
Because when you go back, for example, in Sierra Leone, when people returned, uh, they had to even clean up the bones because when people were being gunned down during the war, nobody was going around burying them. So you have to clean up even the bones to start living in this place again. You know? So all of these things I really describe in, the, in this book. Now, in order for me to, to write this, of course, I, I go back home quite often. Um, I went back home, but you can't conduct formal interviews home anymore because people are tired of it. A lot of people have come and talked to them. So because I speak most of the languages, I was able to uh, do, have informal conversations with people where I would direct conversation in a certain way to get what I needed. So, and then so the rest was my imagination. Um, but in order for me to write in this way, I had to use a language in a particular way. When you read a traditional novel, usually would, uh, it reads a certain way, but this one does not read like that. The way the sentences are ordered, I wanted people to feel as though they were sitting around a fire, participating in a storytelling and receiving a story from an elder. And so because all of the things that I'm talking about occurred not in English, I had to find the English equivalent of how to write uh, about it. When I was a boy, you know, being, coming from a former British uh, sort of educational system, we were taught that the English language is the only medium through which you could express yourself. And of course, it's true to some extent, but it's not the only way. And sometimes when I started writing, I realized that it wasn't sufficient to say certain things. Uh, so when I'm writing, I'm always, there's always the challenge of trying to translate as well. I'm bringing people to a landscape that's not familiar, but also there's the added element of trying to uh, describe things that did not occur in the English language. So I'll give you a few examples. Uh, in Mende, which is my mother tongue and my language, is a very figurative language and very image-driven in the way you speak. And sometimes there are translations that come directly, and sometimes there are some that you have to work for. Uh, for example, how you say night came suddenly. In Mende, you say the sky rolled over and changed its sides. So if I had a choice of writing night came suddenly or the sky rolled over and changed its sides, of course I would write the latter because it evokes an image in you. It, it, it makes you feel you're somewhere different. I'm very particular about la language and landscape when I write because I believe that language has to fit landscape. If I have the older people or the elders speaking to children, in an African context, general, generalizing at this point, they would not say, you guys. That's a very Western usage of the word. They would say, you children, you boys or girls. So I'm, all, I'm very particular about how I use language. So when I'm writing, I'm also translating, as I mentioned. In Mende, again, how you say, um, you describe somebody who is older in their age, you describe the color of their hair. So you would say their hair was the color of stagnant clouds, which means white. Uh, how you say somebody's thoughts were scattered, you will say your mind was like an anthill filled with smoke. Uh, if you think about it, if you take firewood and you put it in an anthill, you see all the ants running in different directions, right? So that really shows, uh, illustrates um, that physicality of, of how your thoughts are scattered. Um, when we describe objects, we also describe the comp components of those objects. Uh, so for example, um, when we say a ball. In English, if I were to write, the children were kicking around a ball. It's great, but it would not really situate you in a particular place. Uh, in Mende, a ball is called fefete, which means a nest of air, or a vessel that carries air. So if I were to say the children kicked around a nest of air, or a vessel that carries air, first of all, the reader is going to say, well, wait a minute, what? And they're going to reread the sentence, and they're going to realize that they are somewhere different. Uh, how you describe time, and you don't say it was 2 o'clock or 5 o'clock, sometimes you, when you're telling a story orally, you would describe how your shadow is moving. Because when the sun begins to rise, your shadow is different parts of your body as the day progresses. So you can say your shadow is leading you, your shadow is behind you, is on your side, and it will indicate time. Sometimes there are also sounds and that you have to find a way to translate. Uh, when you tell a story, sometimes how you indicate time, you make a sound. For example, if you were saying that the character was running Tuk, 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 tuk. Or the character was running, kuju, 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 kuju. These are two different meanings. Tuk, tuk, tuk means the character was running during the daytime. Because when you're running during the daytime, your footsteps are lighter because they're competing with other sounds that are occurring during the daytime. A blacksmith may be doing something, birds may be singing in the trees, children will be playing at the river, and all sorts of things. At night, kuju, 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 your footsteps are heavier because other sounds have quieted. How you can relate to this, perhaps, 
is that if you live below somebody at night when they walk up and down the apartment, you know, if it's a creaky floor, you hear it more than during the daytime because you're consumed with other things. So when you are telling the story, you don't say it was nighttime, you just made a sound and people knew. So when I'm writing, I'm trying to bring all this mood, these feelings into the narrative itself. So what I'm going to do now is to read a little bit uh, to introduce you to some of these things that I'm talking about. Uh, additionally, uh, when I write, for me, nature is also a character. It's not just a bystander. Because I grew up in the countryside, and I believe in the natural world and the spirit of the natural world. I believe in how certain things occur, they will foretell what is to come. And sometimes, even the way a dog would bark at night, you know something was going to happen during the next day that wasn't so good. So there are certain things that, are, that were there. So when I read, you will see some of these things the way I, I render. So I'm going to introduce you to a few things. The first will be the, the first character that opens his book, and as she's walking into town, uh, and then I will introduce you to a few other, other people, and then I, I, I will say a few more words, and then we'll, we'll, we'll have a conversation. <clears throat> it is the end, or maybe the beginning of another story. Every story begins and ends with a woman, a mother, a grandmother, a girl, a child. Every story is a birth. She was the first to arrive where it seemed the wind no longer exhaled. Several miles from town, the trees had entangled one another. Their branches grew toward the ground, burying the leaves in the soil to blind their eyes so the sun would not promise them tomorrow with its rays. It was only the path that was reluctant to cloak its surface completely with grasses as though it anticipated it would soon end its starvation for the warmth of bare feet that gave it life. The long and winding paths were spoken of as snakes that one walked upon to encounter life or to arrive at the places where life lived. Like snakes, the paths were now ready to shed their old skins for new ones, and such occurrences take time with the necessary interruptions. Today, her feet began one of those interruptions. It may be that those whose years have many seasons are always the first to rekindle their broken friendship with the land or it may just have happened this way. Evening was approaching, and the sky was preparing to roll over and change its sides. She sat on the ground, allowing the night breeze to suit her face, her pain, to dry her tears. When she was a child, her grandmother told her that at the quietest hours of night, God and gods would wave their hands through the breeze to wipe just a few things off the face of the earth, so that you'll be able to accommodate the following day. Though her pain didn't completely disappear with the arrival of morning, she felt some new strength within her heart that gave her the idea to pluck herself from the earth and begin cleaning the bones. She rounded the corner and dropped the pile, her heart sinking to her waistbone at the resounding thought of the bones hitting the dusty earth. Her feet gave way under her body as she saw the back of a man sitting on his knees, tying bones together as one would a bundle of kindling. So, what I wanted, uh, this, uh, this chapter goes on a little bit that talks about the encounter between these two elders who had just arrived, and one encounters the other and is in shock because she arrived first and she didn't see anybody, and now this man was in town. He had been around cleaning. So they start to clean. But also there's another hesitation that was there as many after the war. When you heard somebody's voice who you knew from before, you didn't want to turn around to see them. Because to do so, you will take on the burden of whatever condition they may be in. During the war in Syria, one of the things that we became notorious for was amputation. So people were amputated in different parts of their bodies. You know, uh, Sometimes when you were captured, they would ask you, do you want a long sleeve or short sleeves? Uh, you know, and this meant what uh, kind of amputation you want. And I'll read something that talks about that in, in a second. And then, so there were those things. And sometimes people were also amputated in different parts of their body. So, when you turn around to see somebody, you begin to check their body parts to see if everything was intact. You look at their legs, their arms, their ears, their lips. You look at different things to see. And so you literally had this roll call on their body parts, trying to see if they were okay. So they have this encounter. Another thing was also it becomes strange to, to greet people. Before the war, when you greeted people, how you did it was you would ask them elaborately how they were. How are you this morning? How is your grandson? How is your child? How is everybody in the family? You ask about them. 
and they would give you a detailed description about how everybody was doing every morning. And then you would, they would ask you the same. After the war, you could not do this because you did not know who somebody had lost. And so by asking them those questions, you would open that, that wound. So when you encounter somebody, you kind of didn't know. So there are all these difficulties in the tradition. Also, the elders had to find a way to become useful again, to become sort of the teachers they had become. Because during the war, they were no longer useful. They were afraid of the, of the younger people that they were supposed to pass the knowledge on to. So after the war, they begin to bring that back because we believe that the importance of stories, besides the fact that they're medicine, is also how you pass them along to another. And this is the only way the stories can live on. So they go from one vessel to another. And so they strive very hard. Even now in Sierra Leone, when I go home, as I do often, actually, oftentimes I escape winter. This year I haven't been successful uh, in doing that. Uh, <laughs> and my African bones just cannot tolerate winter. I've tried all sorts of things. It's not possible. Um, uh, so when you, when you go home, you go in the countryside, because during the war, the population has also shifted. Most of the younger people are now in the capital city looking for opportunities. You don't find too, that many young people as you used to in the countryside. So when you go into these places, the older people see you, and they will sit you down, and they will tell you stories when you come by. They're thinking to themselves, we got one. Let's tell him or her the stories, because we may not be able to pass it on. But of course, I like that, because as a writer, this is rich information for me, and this is also uh, my tradition. Um, and so, so some of these, uh, this, this story goes, and then it begins to talk about the people who have arrived, and all of them, their encounters and everything. So the next thing that I'm going to read is to kind of give you an idea about um, some of the people that are arriving. Now, what you have is that you have a, a, a family who had been amputated during the war, and they arrive alongside, uh, followed by the child who had done that amputation, who is now a young man, and he returns back to the village. Uh, to, to, to live with them. But this is the encounter that they had heard before uh, all of this. Sila and his children had been in the area around Imperi for two years before the war ended. He had been able to escape the attack on the town with only his two children carrying the younger one and pulling the other along. Sila had kept them together since, hiding in the forest, moving to other towns until they were attacked, and then back to the forest. Then one day he had decided to take his children to the capital city to register them for school. The war wasn't coming to an end as quickly as he had thought. That evening, after walking all day, he and his children stopped to pass the night in the ruins of a town about eight miles from Imperi. Unfortunately, a squad of armed men and boys had also been passing through and decided to spend the night in the same burnt village, which had two houses whose roofs were somewhat intact. The men captured Sila and his children and tied them to a tree until morning. The children were seven and six at that time. Their father's eyes told them not to cry. He could not speak as he had been beaten on his head earlier when he tried to plead for his children not to be tied so tightly. His swollen jawbone and head had pained him all night, but he couldn't cry because he wanted to remain strong for his children. In the morning, the commander asked a slim little boy with a long, rough, pimpled face, they called him Sergeant Cutlass, to chop off the family's hands. I am in a very good mood, so you only have your hands cut off. You can keep your lives for today. The commander had said, I am giving you my best man for the job. He is so good that by the time you think about it, it will be finished. He laughed and called on the sergeant. The young boy's sunken face was as cold as the blades he carried. All of them had residues of blood and flesh, and some were dull, while others were very sharp. Depending on how much pain the commander wanted his victims to feel, he would ask for either a dull or sharp machete. This young boy had been forced at gunpoint to do his first cutting when he was nine years old, and they were the hands of his mother, father, grandmother, and two uncles. Afterward, the commander had killed them because the boy didn't do the job to his liking. It wasn't as clean as I wanted, he had said before shooting all of them. The commander had then made the boy part of the group to fight as a soldier with the special task of chopping off hands only. Okay, bring them here. The commander asked for Sila and his children to be brought to the log near the bushes. Sergeant Cutlass, go on, and we move out after. One last thing. If any of you make any noise, I will have you all shot. 
He laughed as the hands of his children were first placed on the logs and cut, and then it was Silas' turn. Sergeant Cutlass had cut many hands, but this was the second time that they tormented him. The first had been his family. He didn't know what, about, what, what it was, but something about this family got to him. He had also never witnessed such silence from cuts. Even when the commander had threatened to shoot people, they cried out. Not this family, though. The silence made him hear the sound that the machete made when he went through the flesh, the bone, and then the flesh again, finally hitting the log. The sound echoed in his head from that day on. The commander had told the sergeant to cut with a combination of long sleeve and short sleeve, which meant a cut above the elbow, short sleeve, and below the, the wrist, long sleeve. The squad left right after they had chopped Silas' hands and his children's. The commander had thought that they would die bleeding, but Sila had lost enough people already. He rolled on the ground to gain some strength, got up, looked for some old clots, and using his one hand and mouth, tied the fresh wounds of his children and himself. It ceased their bleeding just a bit. He begged his children to forgive him because he was unable to protect them, and also encouraged them to be strong, to stand up and walk with him. They did, all of them weak and staggering from the loss of blood. They continued, though, their father calling, Hawa, Mada, you are still there. Don't leave your father alone. Yes, Papa, each would say, and sometimes Hawa would reach his right hand to wipe the sweat off her youngest brother's face. They went on in this manner until they hit the main road where they all fainted on the earth at the side of the road. Um, now, this family had returned to the town of Imperi, and this young man, Anis, who had done this cutting, also followed them, and he was trying to find a way to reconcile with them. But of course, oftentimes we toss the idea of reconciliation and recovery very loosely. It is not very easy at all. We've experienced it. Oftentimes we just say, oh, forgive each other. It's not that easy. Uh, because it's a two ways. You, know, you have to ask for it, and somebody has to be willing and ready. And you have to give them that time. It is a process. So imagine living in the ruins of a town that had been destroyed by war, and your hands are no longer there, and you see the person who did that to you. And can you learn to forgive them? Can you begin to see that person as just another child again? Uh, how do you do that? So all these questions are asked as people begin to, 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 to live in this, in this town. Now, of course, their lives begin to come together. They begin to move on. Uh, because one thing that you see about my people in Sierra Leone, and generally on the African continent, is that people are very uh, uh, strong and resilient. Um, and they are very hopeful. Um, and this comes because of our traditions, our wisdom, and the intelligence of that tradition that, that fears people. So oftentimes when people are uh, uh, spoken of, or when they hear about the suffering that had occurred in some places, I think there's an expectation that people walk around sort of carrying their burdens and looking defeated. But when you go to any of these countries, you don't see that. During the day, people will struggle to make ends meet, but they have this radiance about them, this love for life that you would never know that they'd been through such things because we don't carry our burdens around. We put them aside and move on, you know. And so when you go to Syria, in which I've taken a lot of friends of mine, they always turn around and say to me, are you sure this is where the war occurred? Because people are laughing. Uh, you know, if somebody goes to see a football match, soccer, in this case, football, soccer, they would, they would watch and discuss passionately as if there's no tomorrow. After, on one occasion, I was back home in Sierra Leone, and I was taking a taxi, uh, which in our form of taxi, Rarely would you see one that one person takes by themselves. There's, there are some, but you know, usually people don't. So you sit in a taxi and another person just jumps in it that you don't know, they sit next to you, and you have a conversation you know, about whatever they, they are talking about. And so I was in one taxi and there were some foreigners, and this guy was driving, and he's a Manchester United fan, which is a football club, soccer club in the UK. Um, and so I could tell what was about to happen, and he needed to go to the game. So he turned around to his customers as he's driving by a place where they're showing the game and said, you know, I'm going to the match. And when it's over, I can take you to where I'd agree to take you to. So you should come with me to watch the match. And of course, his passengers are thinking, no, you have to take us. We paid you the money. And he said to them, well, you can come with me and then we can go after, you know. And they said, no, no, no. They said, well, I'll give you back your money, but I'm going to the match. So he packed the car. You know? <laughs> so the reason why I'm explaining this story is that you know, uh, my people are like that, which is that they have this ability to just enjoy the simple moments of life, you know, and that's really where their joy comes from. 
you know, to suspend everything that's going on and just enjoy that moment in the time with another human being as if that's all that exists at that time. And we have that ability. It comes from our traditions. And so when you read this book, you see that even though people are struggling, um, they will challenge your idea of happiness, which is that often we all believe happiness is this continuum. I'm happy for five months, one year, two years in a row with no interruption at all. That's not happiness. It's not possible. Happiness is these simple moments, this joy, the ability to, to be in front of another human being and be consumed with the fortitude of, of their humanity, uh, to genuinely love, uh, to go to a disco and dance like there's no tomorrow, to raise a family, even with the backdrop of all of these challenges. So for them, happiness is not the absence of a challenge or challenges in, in one's life. It's with those challenges, the ability to still find meaning and beauty in life. And so that's what you would see in this book uh, a lot. Uh, so, of course, all of my writing would not have a Hollywood ending because it's not realistic, where people go prancing in the sunlight and singing uh, some kumbaya or whatever you may call it. Uh, so you would not have that because that's not realistic to what life really is, you know. Uh, every day you face challenges some more significant than others. So you will see that uh, uh, in, this, in this narrative. And um, so this time comes back together and things like that uh, begin to occur. I'm going to read one last chapter to you and, and then I will close it and then we'll really have a discussion. I'll open up. And this is a chapter that, this is an area in the book, not necessarily a chapter, that talks about uh, the storytelling that had started and what it was beginning to do to people. So when people had returned, uh, the children went to the river to swim, and they discover a body that had been floating under the shrubs that they had let loose because they were shaking the river. And so the adults decided to start one of those storytelling gatherings they used to have to tell them stories uh, and to begin to bring back that tr tradition again into their lives. <clears throat> the light from the fire painted the dark shadows of everyone on the walls of the houses behind them. The young people weren't as plentiful and some sat reluctantly by the fire. The eager ones were the generations of Umu and Thomas, who had heard of moments such as this from their parents, and some exceptional ones like Hawa and Mada, who despite what they had endured, had a joy within them that such a tradition sparked even more. The other few who had arrived in town without parents and roamed about, helping here and there to get some food, sat by themselves. They listened to the story, with one ear focused on the gathering and the other on God. Colonel and his brothers and sister were among this group. He had gathered every young and parentless individual in town to fetch wood and prepare the fire. During that work, he had also told them it was their du duty to make sure that things went smoothly to prevent any outside intrusion and had assigned each a position and task for the night. No matter who was present and why, the entire town had come to hear a story from Mamakadi and, and from whoever else would be moved to tell. This was the tradition. The elders, mostly women, would tell a story and, and the other elders would join in afterward. Some nights it would go on until even children were called upon to retell stories they had heard. Tonight, Mamakadi stood up inside the circle and walked around the fire as she told the story, adjusting the wood every so often to make the fire brighter or duller depending on the mood of the tale. Some of the boys who had sat away gradually came closer. Story, story, what should I do with you? She had shouted, and the call for the teller to start, and the audience responded. Please tell it to us so we can pass it to others. She went on a number of times until everyone was asking to be told a story. There was a man who always complained about his condition and was unhappy with every aspect of his life, especially about his only pair of trousers, which, which had holes in them everywhere. Parts of his flesh could be seen through the trousers, so it looked from afar as though he had on a checkered pants. When he got closer, you could not help but laugh at the natural beautification of his trousers. Soon, all the young people whose pants had holes in them were referring to it as a new style, skin to clot. The tailor in town was of course unhappy about this and blamed the man for, with the holes in his trousers for ruining his business. No one came to get things mended anymore. Natural beautification had taken over. The tailor followed the man everywhere, waiting for the perfect time to steal and destroy his trousers. Late one afternoon, 
After the man had returned from his farm, he decided to bathe in the river. He took off his trousers and carefully washed them. Then he laid them on the grasses to dry and went into the river. He submerged himself in the water to get a nice soak. The tailor, who had been hiding in the bushes, decided this was his chance. But as he was preparing to move toward the trousers, another man came out of the bushes, took the trousers, and disappeared. When the man came out of the river, he couldn't believe his pants were missing. He called out, if this is some kind of a joke from God or any human, I am not laughing. He waited a while, but no response. Then he saw the footprints of the thief and began laughing so hard he fell into the water and struggled to pull himself out, still laughing. He said, there must be somebody worse off than I am, and if so, please enjoy whatever is left of my trousers. <laughs> Thank you, God and gods, for not making me the poorest of men. He danced in the grasses while the tailor watched, still not happy because he knew the thief would use the trousers. He wanted them destroyed. When the man walked down the path, Toward the, when the man walked down the path toward the town, the tailor rose from hiding. He thought he should clean the cool and cool himself off. He took off his clothes and dove into the river. The naked man heard the sound of the water and ran back, thinking he could see who had stolen from him. He saw no one, only some fresh new clothes, long pants and a shirt. He looked around, but the tailor was deep under the water, enjoying its coolness, even the top of the river had calmed. The man danced as he wore the new clothes, thinking that this was a wonderful day. When the tailor came up for air, he noticed that he had nothing to wear. It was a strange thing to see a naked tailor running through town. <laughs> the gathering was in a fit of laughter. Colonel Ernest and Miller were the only ones to whom laughter didn't succeed in introducing herself. Ernest's eyes searched for Scylla and his children, watching their happy mood brought a stroke of peace in his heart. Colonel looked around to see whether he could determine who the thief had been. Miller witnessed too, had witnessed too many hardships to think about stories, to fill the functions of them. He got up and walked away as though the laughter was tormenting him. After the laughter died down, the adults and elders formed their own circle, leaving the children to themselves to talk about the stories. The adults and elders started a serious conversation about godliness. The imam and the pastor agree that all human beings embody God within them. Then how do you explain what happened during the war, someone asked. There was no answer for a while, and then Pamoywa spoke. When we are suffering so much, I believe whatever godliness that is within us departs temporarily. During the war, all that, is, that it brought about, we as a people of this land chipped away at the embodiment of God within us until all the traces of goodness that were left after God departed were gone. And now there are, there are many who are empty vessels and therefore can only be filled with anything. I think stories and the old ways would bring them in contact with life, with living, and with godliness again. Of course, these aren't the only things. There are practical measures that must be taken. There was silence among them, but the children were playing games, laughing and clapping. If God could be anywhere, this was where he or she was tonight. Um, so, <clears throat> so, in a way, as I said earlier, when you read this story, I would really, there are certain instances where you feel yourself being invited uh, to my country, to my people, to meet them, experience them, see their intelligence, because for me, this is how I write. I approach writing in the following manner. And it's the last thing that I will say, and I'll open it up. Uh, Albert Camus, uh, a writer, a Nigerian fellow, is one of my favorite writers. And I'll paraphrase a quote that he has, which is that he says, the role of a writer is not to uh, represent uh, those who make history, but rather those who suffer history. So I really come from that point of view, writing about those who suffer history, because I come from that uh, area myself. Um, so I believe that um, uh, my people are amazing in their own way, so, and of course they face a lot of challenges. So I want to use literature to introduce the word to them, to their traditions, their wisdom, their beauty, their struggles as well, uh, to the way they dream, whether it works or it fails or not. Uh, they should be in charge of how they interpret those things. So throughout my writing, you, you will be introduced to uh, amazing characters such as this, 
uh, that reflect what I think of my people, uh, observation, and also a lot of my imagination. Uh, with that said, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I want to thank Fan for uh, uh, certainly bringing me to you tonight. And to all the young people and the teachers uh, who, who brought them and who have been teaching uh, the first book to them, uh, thank you. And uh, please, uh, there are microphones on either side of the aisle. Raise your hand and they will come to you and we'll have a discussion. Thank you.